Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. Our guest today is Jessica, and Jessica helps men overcome porn and any sex addiction, any related sex addiction. Um, she's here to help them overcome it. Now, I'm going to give the floor to Jessica because I want her to tell you a little about herself and what she does, and she has some topics she wants to go over. I also want to mention that she has her own podcast on our channel. So if you go to her podcast, you will see all her segments and everything that she's done so far. And she has some really uh, powerful topics that she talks about in her podcast. So I suggest that you go over onto the advisor, scroll down to Jessica's um a podcast and you'll see some really great podcasts that will have a huge impact on your life. So Jessica, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, thank you, Stacy. So this is, uh, well, first, it's an honor to be here. And <laughs> this is my second recording with you that I'm really excited about. <laughs> and I know we were just talking about like, what topics should we even cover? Because there are so many amazing and important and relevant ones. Yes for your listeners. And so um, I'll, in a nutshell, if anyone hasn't listened to the, the previous uh, recording that we did together, in a nutshell, I'll let you know that. So I help men overcome pornography addiction or sex-related addiction through trauma healing. And how I got into that was uh, essentially back in 2016, I had a naturally occurring seafood neurotoxin that put a 19 millimeter lesion on the left front lobe of my brain. And my brain created something called hypersexuality disorder, which is essentially became like an instant sex addict without even necessarily going out to make all the actions and decisions to lead to it. Right. Um, and during my five-year recovery journey, uh, three years of that, I was dating a man who was severely addicted to pornography and alcohol and casually did cocaine and all sorts of things and also was a narcissist and um, my subconscious mind was very attracted to a man like that because my subconscious self-worth was in a very low place and we always attract someone that reflects our subconscious self-worth yeah. and so um, that is a very much so a nutshell. <laughs> of what made me decide to switch from being a wildlife biologist to now having the world's most comprehensive porn addiction recovery program on the planet. And which I'm, I'll just say it is the most proud thing that I've ever done in my entire life. I'm just thrilled. My clients are my heroes. They are incredible. And, um, and it just fills me with joy to see others on their healing journey, taking the brave and courageous steps that are necessary to overcome any addiction, no matter what the addiction. Right. And essentially, you know, as I mentioned last time is uh, any addiction, no matter what the addiction is a symptom of unresolved trauma. And that yeah. trauma is a, an unresolved emotional wounds of the past that create that sense of insecurity in the nervous system, in the subconscious mind. And now the subconscious mind says, oh my gosh, I feel totally unsafe. Let me go reach for something to fill me with the neurochemicals of safety. And anything that's addictive is what fills the body with a false sense of safety based on the neurochemicals present, whether it is a drug or a substance or a behavior. Mm -hmm. And so... I'll kind of lead in with that. <laughs> you know, I, I find it very interesting how we were talking about sometimes, you know, people, you know, they're addicted, you know, and they uh, uh, to porn or any type of sex addict, but down below, they really have the root cause is something completely different. They've either gone through trauma in their life. They were a victim of some sort of event that left, you know, a traumatic wound inside them. And they reverted to something like sex addiction, or they reverted to something like porn addiction. Now, why do you think it, you know, there's there's so many things people could do. Some people go to, you know, alcohol addiction, or they go to food for addiction. And I guess it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what addiction, they just need a coping mechanism, right? It, it, or is there a reason why some of these people actually go towards sex or porn for their comfort zone? Own? Yes. 
Yes, yes. So, well, with pornography, pornography never requires you to be vulnerable. It never rejects you. It's always mm. there and always available. It doesn't require you to be brave. It doesn't require you to show up with dignity, with respect for yourself or others. It's right. And, and so many of my clients and just anyone around the world who is addicted to pornography oftentimes has extremely subconscious low self-worth. What does that translate to? Extreme fear of rejection. Mm. What's the ultimate way to not get rejected, but be filled with the neurochemicals of, of acceptance? Yeah. Pornography. Right. And so yeah. that's one reason why pornography addiction is, is rampant and everywhere is because right. there are so many people that are suffering from those things that it is attempting to provide, but ultimately making it worse. And I'll actually share a story yeah. of why I realized, actually, I just realized this in the past year, why I believe myself, why I personally, why my brain developed hypersexuality disorder. And there are two reasons for that. And hypersexuality disorder, just if anyone doesn't know what that is, it is essentially when your subconscious mind creates extremely, and I mean, extremely high sexual urges to the point where it is an addiction. And right. when, and it is, it is a nightmare. I would not wish it on my worst enemy. Your mind and your body become an ultimate torture chamber. Yeah. It is not fun. <laughs> it is, <laughs> it is torture. And so I believe that there are two reasons why my brain did that. It was attempting to do that to, to heal me mm -hmm. for two reasons. One, when we have a sexual experience, there's a neurochemical that spikes and elevates and it's called oxytocin. Mm -hmm. And oxytocin is actually the neurochemical that is required in order to heal from addiction, from trauma, and from a chronic illness of which I had all of them. Right. The and so I believe it was actually the inner wisdom of my subconscious mind attempting to have me go out and create a behavior that would boost my oxytocin because right. the subconscious mind goes, that's what, that's the neurochemical needed for emotional healing, for mm -hmm. trauma healing, for addiction healing. And well, Side note, when I healed all those things, my chronic illness went away because chronic yeah. illness is usually a symptom also of unresolved trauma because the way yeah. that the, the illness, the emotional illness uh, or trauma changes our epigenetic expression such that we actually have a higher chance of uh, experiencing chronic illness and disease. And so uh, there's a book called The Myth of Normal by Dr. Gabor Mate, if anyone wants to go deep into that. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that for there's a lot of people who have head trauma and brain damage yeah. who develop hypersexuality disorder. Oh, really? I actually have, I know someone who was suffering for years from extreme uh, toxic black mold exposure. And she also developed hypersexuality disorder. Wow. That was a microscopic neurotoxin. I also had a microscopic neurotoxin that that triggered this. Wow. Um, and I wonder how rampant hypersexuality disorder is in the NFL, NFL with all of the head injuries and concussions. Yeah. And I recently met someone who used to date someone from uh, the 49ers. And I've mm -hmm. mentioned that to her and she, I didn't know she was dating someone in the past. She used to, um, I, I don't know who it was or, you know, how long ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know that she was dating someone at some point with in the 49ers. And I said, I believe that the NFL might have a lot of hypersexuality disorder from all of the brain, you know, stuff going on. And yeah. she looked at me and she goes, yes. She goes, I have heard so many stories. I used to date one. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> um, and so that is just happens to be a common response to people who have a head related injury. And sometimes it's through like a car accident or, you know, being on a football team. And right. sometimes 
from a microscopic neurotoxin that mm -hmm. is small enough to pass the blood brain barrier and wreak havoc in the brain and the autonomic nervous system, and which was my case. Mm -hmm. But that's one reason why I believe that my body essentially developed a sex addiction. And there's another story there. So that's kind of like the scientific reasoning, right? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> There, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a study done on that. Uh -huh. may, I'm very curious if there's any scientists looking for a research study who's a neurobiologist or so, like, please research that. Yeah, <laughs> please, definitely. Please. Um, and, you know, this past year, I realized something from my childhood that had me develop a subconscious pattern, which was a pattern for me to attempt to feel safe and protected. Since I grew up with childhood trauma uh, and feeling unsafe almost everywhere I went, whether it was school or home or uh, the church that I was raised in mm -hmm. um, as a Jehovah's Witness, um, I'm not one anymore, um, but it was like everywhere I went in, in my life, I didn't feel safe. I was a very nervous, nervous, anxious child. Right. And I didn't know that I was like that. I just was in a freeze response. You know, there's fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. It was a freeze response. The freeze response was like uh, my go-to, my go-to yeah. response. Um, and so I had developed that partially because I, well, fully, <laughs> because yeah. on a subconscious level, I didn't feel loved or seen or important or valuable mm -hmm. and part of that was because my mom herself had tremendous trauma that she had un been, you know unresolved trauma from her childhood and from her things that she had gone through that yeah. in attachment style she had developed what's called um the avoidant attachment style there are four attachment styles if anyone's familiar with attachment theory only one of them is the healthy right so it's called secure attachment. The three others, um, which I don't know exactly the statistics, but I think it's roughly around 30% of people do not fall in the secure attachment style. It may even be more than that. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than that, actually. And so yeah. um, there's the avoidant attachment style. And a person develops that when they have when when they were children and they want to just express them their whole self. They just want to go express themselves. Yeah. And they were they were either shamed or belittled or yelled at, or basically they felt unsafe to be in this world as themselves. Right. And then that shuts them off from emotion. They don't feel emotionally safe to get close to other people. And they become avoidant or, or dismissive. Yeah. And so my mom was a dismissive avoidant who then was not emotionally available for her four kids. Right. And did not feel safe in her own skin for physical affection or physical touch because of some of the past experiences that she had. So it even made her feel unsafe to uh, provide safe and loving touch to her babies and to her children. Yeah. And I remember growing up that my mom was very proud of the fact that she did not give hugs. And wow. that was a subconscious protection mechanism that her subconscious mind had had developed. And so at home, you know, my dad worked so hard and he was gone working a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then, but he, at the home situation, my dad was actually like my safe place. My right. dad was, I felt the safest with. Um, yeah. And then at school, I was the one who was bullied and ostracized because of being a Jehovah's Witness and being made fun of. And they are the different one. And when kids are singing Christmas songs or handing out birthday, uh, you know, cupcakes, you have to go sit in the hallway by yourself while everyone else is having fun. And mm. so, you know how kids are. They're mean and they bully yeah. the ones who's different. And they, the kids can sense who the insecure ones were. And that was me to the strongest degree. Right. And so then, and then, um, so basically I just didn't really feel safe anywhere. Um, in the Jehovah's Witness church I was raised in, my family was the lowest on the totem pole because my dad was not a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. So when we went there, we were at the family who was kind of like 
the broken one lowest on the totem pole because my dad was um, not, he was not only a, not a Jehovah's Witness, but he was actively and very strongly against their teachings. So our mm. family was the spiritually dangerous ones to be around because of who my dad was when we went there. Right. So um, I had this feeling of not belonging anywhere yeah. I went, essentially. Right. Like, I didn't belong in my mom's arms. I didn't belong at school. I didn't belong at the church I went to. Right. And so what is, there's only one way for the subconscious mind of a child to interpret that. I am unlovable. Mm. Yes, makes sense. And then the subconscious mind goes, I'm unlovable because I'm inadequate. Mm -hmm. I'm unlovable because I'm worth rejecting. Right. And so the subconscious mind then says, let me hide all of the parts of who I am that are at risk of me being rejected even more. Right. That's how I became an extreme people pleaser mm -hmm. with no boundaries. Yeah. And so, so that kind of set the tone of saying, okay, at childhood trauma, which I was not aware that I had childhood trauma until after I got brain damage and PTSD where I had obvious adult trauma and I was doing research and reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And oh, that's, wow. when, that's when I learned that I had childhood trauma and it was absolutely terrifying because I felt totally isolated, totally broken, totally unfixable. And yeah. that there was no one in the world who would understand what I had was going through. Right. And at that point, I didn't realize at that point how commonplace trauma is. It's right. more common than not. Yeah. And I also didn't realize that anyone and everyone can heal from their trauma. Yeah. So not knowing those things, it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And then going back to, this is a very long uh, introduction on why I believe I developed a sex-related addiction. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great story because it, it, it covers a lot of different areas on what leads to it. So go on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I'm hoping that anyone listening can find their story in mine, different circumstance, different events, but your story is embedded in my story. I know it is right in some way, shape or form. And so then, you know, I remember this thing that happened when I was, I want to say I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I was walking with my cousin, Selena in McHenry, Illinois, rural Illinois. I grew up with a cornfield on my street <laughs> And um, essentially, we were, my cousin Selena was over for the day visiting. And we walked maybe, I don't know, two miles into town or so across the Fox River, the bridge. And on our way back to my house, we were maybe halfway over the bridge. We were, I want to say we were 14 years old. And this red truck drove by. And there were two men in the truck. And the windows were down and it was summertime. And my cousin and I, we had short shorts and like halter tops on. And my cousin, Selena, she had uh, been more like, I guess you could say sexually developed as far as like, like she hit puberty sooner than I did. Yeah. Um, and to, in a way that would attract the attention of men, even though we, we were 14 year old girls. Right. Um, and these men, they turned their heads and whistled out of the window and made a gesture. And my cousin Selena looked at me and was like, do you know what that means? And I remember getting a, an extreme high. My body got an extreme rush. It was the rush of a high that an addict experiences. Mm -hmm. And what that was in that moment, my subconscious mind said, Oh, this is how you're valuable. Mm. This, do you see how they reacted to you? You've never been valuable before. Here's your moment. This is how you do it. And my subconscious mind remembered that so strongly. It was such a massively emotionally charged moment. Yeah. From external validation because I had none from within. Right. I had no sense of self-worth. And so now I get this extreme ego boosting dopamine high from these men who whistled out the window at me as a 14 year old girl. Right. 
And my subconscious mind says, you need to repeat this experience because this is the only way that you've learned how to feel valuable to this right. point in life. And so on a subconscious level, then I was driven to wear the shorts shorter, you know, to, mm -hmm. to put the makeup on stronger, right? to make sure that when I leave the house, I am getting that external validation seeking that my subconscious mind is after. Yeah. Because it's how my subconscious mind learned how to feel safe. Right. We feel safe when we feel valued. Right. And so my subconscious mind created the subconscious pattern of creating sexual attention for men. And so I believe, and so essentially that's, you know, I was like <laughs> so many things that I had going on in life were yeah. go, go get that, go get that attention. And so I believe that when I had adult PTSD mm -hmm. from this neurotoxin, and it, I literally didn't know if I was going to survive or not. I felt it was the most unsafe I felt in my entire life. Yeah. Subconscious mind goes, do you remember how you create safety? You go get that external validation through the sexual experience. Mm -hmm. and so I believe that's another very strong reason why my subconscious mind said, okay, we're going to give you hypersexuality disorder and have your libido be so high that you're going to go out and seek that experience. Right. And so to answer your question, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do I think that like certain addictions show up for a reason? Like, why did I not develop alcohol addiction? Why did I develop hypersex hypersexuality disorder instead? Right. That's the reason. That's the reason. That makes so much sense. You know, when you go through the story like that, it's, it's, it's wow. And it's just like, oh my gosh, but it makes so much sense when you grew up in a household like that, where love is not exemplified, then you go to school and you're ostracized because your religion is different. And then you can't participate in all the activities. And then, you know, it, it then you go to your own church that you have a belief in at the time. And because your father is not a believer, you're put all the way on the bottom of the totem pole. So your whole life was being rejected in some form. And then that yeah. one moment you went by that, that feeling inside, that feeling of self-worth. For the first time, you probably felt that feeling of self-worth, like, wow, you know, they like me, they want me, you know? And so then you kept repeating the same behavior that they mm -hmm. wanted from you because you wanted to feel accepted something that you've never felt before, you know, and something you probably yearn for deep down in your heart. And you never realized all those years until it was brought out that one moment. But the, unfortunately, you know, you were exemplifying it for the wrong reasons, but who cares when you're going through a problem like that, you're not looking for reasons. You want to just feel good, you know, and sometimes people do, they, they make the wrong choices because they just want to feel good. It makes them feel good even though it might not be the best thing for them. So what happens when someone gets stuck? When when someone is a victim and they get stuck in a certain behavior, how mm -hmm. do they get out of that behavior? Because now they've gotten themselves into, you know, their whole life they've had problems that stem from the root cause or mm -hmm. from trauma. And then they finally find something that makes them feel good. And they're kind of stuck. They're stuck repeating that behavior because it keeps yeah. making them feel good. So how do you get unstuck? How, you know, because sometimes I know you were mentioning to me early on that sometimes people, you know, they will tell other people their story and they want to see their reaction and they might tell them the sexual story. And mm -hmm. for another person who doesn't have hypersexuality disorder or doesn't have anything to do with porn addiction or any type of sexual addiction, they're going to look at them like, oh, you know, but that person is it's making them feel good to tell the story because in, in, in their other side of their world, they have people who will put them on a pedestal for that. But then you go to an other person who's brought up differently or feels differently, and they're not going to give you the same reaction because they're a different person with different thoughts, different ways of living in a different environment. 
So they look for that group, that environment that's going to accept them. So they're stuck. They're a victim of their own behaviors and they're stuck in their environment. How do you get out of that? Yeah. So that's, that's a, I mean, we could do a 10 hour podcast episode. Of that, <laughs> that, uh, that one. Um, there are so many different, let me start with uh, the topic of forgiveness, just because that topic has been showing up all around me with other people talking about it. I'm currently yeah. um, making an amazing presentation about it. There's so much. So um, when we're living by not forgiveness, we yeah. are essentially poisoning ourselves on a neurochemical level, on an emotional level. We're disempowering ourselves, even if, especially if there is a real life person out there in your life who legitimately wronged you and treated you in a way that stirred up valid, challenging emotional pain in your life. Right. And so there's a difference between intellectual forgiveness and emotional forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. Emotional forgiveness is when you feel it down to the depths of your, you know, soul. And I'll, I'll give an example of it. So, um, you know, I used to share the victim story of the way that my mom used to treat me and how, when I was 17 or 18, she disowned me and she declared to my face, consider yourself disowned from this whole family. And when I left the Jehovah's Witness organization. Um, and I used to tell people the horrors of my mom's behavior. And every time I told that story to people, I learned who to tell it to so that I would get the, once again, external validation. Yeah. So it was another form. I was using my mom in the way that she treated me as a way to go receive and achieve external validation. So mm-hmm. just be stuck in my victim story with that. Which right. Is- never empowering it just stirs up that the righteous indignation which is that external validation seeking uh, behaviors and the external validation seeking emotions yeah are highly addictive in and of themselves this is why people get addicted to their victim story mm-hmm. it's one of the reasons not the only reason and so um essentially i mean one of the things that i had to do was forgive the people who had caused tremendous pain in my life. And when we do that to the fullest degree, we actually begin to have compassion for that individual and we begin to see their own suffering. Right. So, um, I mean, an example of that, like with my mom and the way that she would, you know, unintentionally reject her children. Yeah while you know trying to protect them but not knowing how it's like her coming from a place of love and wanting to protect her kids but not knowing how because of her traumas yeah uh, you know she had the absolute bravery to tell me in recent years that that she believes that my trauma be- began in the womb when she was pregnant with me and this is a good thing for people to know Because the emotions that your mother is experiencing when you are in the womb will directly affect you in such strong ways. Oh, a hundred percent. It even can affect um, the the size ratio of the amygdala of your brain, which is the fear response. Really? Mothers who have unresolved trauma when they're pregnant, um, the amygdala of the brain can actually be larger and have a stronger portion of the brain devoted to the fear response. Even when, when conception occurs and the egg drops, the, I I think it's 240 characteristics are already developed in the baby already, the embryo, you know? And so just think of that 240 characteristics, just when the egg is flowing down the fallopian tube. And so it, 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 you know, when you think about that and you think about what you just said, it's like, mm-hmm. it's amazing. Your, your personality, the way your brain is developing, everything is, is starting to begin formulating at such a, such a quick and short period of time that, that, you know, that baby is, is, is already formulated and it, and it's, it's not even a, a full baby yet. It's not, it, it's just an embryo and, and, you know, it, it's, it's beginning to develop, but so much has occurred in that short period of time. It's pretty amazing. It is. And this is where, and I, I want to honor my mom's bravery for telling me this because it was very vulnerable for her. She said that she believes that my 
trauma began in the wound and it's uh, the trauma via the rejection wound, the rejection wound, because she said that when she was pregnant with me, she did not want to be pregnant with me. She oh, wow. Wait. Yeah, that she couldn't wait till I was out. Really? She couldn't wait till I was out. And she said, I think that's why you were born prematurely because you could sense that I didn't want you there. Oh, wow. But even for her to say that to you, again, the rejection, you, you, it's like you've nonstop throughout your entire life have been rejected over and over and over and over again from even the time that she disowned you to the time that she says that to you. It's like, you know. And, yeah. And, you know, when she said that to me, she was saying it from a place of um, wanting to understand my pain and having mm -hmm. She was coming from a place of compassion. Mm -hmm. She's been doing actually a really like awesome, amazing job in the last couple of years of yeah. reaching out to me so that we can heal our traumas together. That's and that nice. was one of them. That that was one of those moments. Um and so once I I eventually began to truly in my heart forgive my mom, understanding that everything that she did that was painful to me came from a place of her own tremendous suffering. Mm -hmm. And so instead of me having feelings of just anger, rejection, confusion, you mean, you name it. It's yeah. it was, I converted that energy, that emotional energy into compassion for her, yeah. her suffering. And that helped to heal me because when we as human beings if we live by the the emotions of compassion yeah that is so much healthier and uplifting and empowering and motivating in our bodies it is our, rather than living by anger resentment you know jealousy fear rejection abandonment it's like hey let's convert that into um, gratitude for having the experience because of the strength yeah. and resiliency you had to adopt and and grow into as a result of it while simultaneously having compassion for the people who have hurt you in your life because right. recognizing recognizing what they went through in their life because yeah. people don't treat other people like that when it comes from a place of pain hurt and confusion yeah very true so true yeah and so I, I, go ahead that um that forgiveness piece it's forgiving others and then also forgiving yourself, because when someone is on this journey to overcome an addiction, usually the, the person that they hate the most is themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's usually an enormous amount of shame. And it is impossible to heal and recover from addiction or trauma when living by the emotions of shame, anger, resent, resentment, jealousy, like any emotion that is a stress response. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to heal and recover when living by that emotion. Wow. And how do you, how do you go about getting rid of those emotions, yeah. those negative emotions? Because that those, those emotions are powerful and they can destroy you. They are. they are. And yeah, you know, I've shifted away from calling them negative emotions mm -hmm. because they are mandatory emotions and we need them and they serve a purpose. And right. when we listen to them and pay mm -hmm. attention to them yes. and allow them to surface and explore them, then there's always a message that there's always a message there for us. Right. For example, if I'm lonely, uh, you know, a lot of my clients, they would say like, oh, they, they suffer from loneliness. How do they alleviate it in the moment? Pornography, mm -hmm. YouTube binging, social media, emotional eating, you know, online shopping, drinking alcohol, like whatever yeah. you name it. And it's, oh, how do I alleviate loneliness? I can either escape from it from an unhealthy escapism choice that won't serve me, but it'll serve as uh, my subconscious mind can forget about it in the moment and not feel the pain of it in the moment, escape right. from the pain. Or or I can go take action in my life to make connection because the opposite mm -hmm. of loneliness is connection. Right. And also addiction. Mm -hmm. The opposite of addiction is connection. Right. And so there's connection on three different levels. I think most people will definitely agree on the two. And I would say everyone will agree on the, the two, but the third one, um, it depends on what your belief system is. Right. So I'll touch on what those three connection pieces are. The obvious one is saying, okay, the opposite of addiction is connection, is connection with another person. 
And the only way that we can connect in a meaningful way with another person to alleviate the loneliness is to tap into that vulnerable side. Right. Which then requires bravery. Let yeah. me connect in a way that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. so let me feel vulnerable at times which means I want to pull out that bravery card and be courageous. And it's being deeply seen, seeing others and being deeply seen right? and connecting with others. And then the other connection piece, which a lot of people don't think of is the connection to self. How connected are you to yourself? How well do you know yourself? Right. Almost, almost everyone thinks that they know themselves very well and very deeply. Yeah. But what they really know, they know that they know the experience that they have in life. Mm -hmm. People are well acquainted with the experience they have in life, but most people are very distanced from who they actually are. Yeah. And this is all parts of your identity. Every subconscious program that we have, we are made up of walking, talking programs on a subconscious level, about 95% of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. By the time we're what age like 25 is a, a set of subconscious programs mm -hmm. that are not set in stone. Yeah. This is all of our, our choices, our behaviors, our actions, our reactions, the thoughts that show up in our mind. There's so many different things that we do as human beings every single day, all day long, that is a set of subconscious programs. Right. How aware are we of those? <laughs> Yeah. Most people are not very aware. That's where one of the strengths in my program is to become deeply aware of those. Yeah. And it's not just what the programs are, it's why they showed up. Right. Why did this program? Oh, I the, my subconscious programming of looking for external validation seeking behaviors, mm -hmm. ah, that showed up as a result of subconscious low self-work. Right. That's the why, the why behind the pattern. Yeah. And so let's figure out what all of these patterns are and then identify the ones that are disempowering mm -hmm. and let's grow the ones that are empowering. Right. And then the ones we identify as disempowering. Let's use our conscious rational mind to convert them into a new empowering pattern that you would rather have it be. I'm kind yeah. of <laughs> deviating away here from going into solutions oriented mode. Um, on the, so that level of connection with yourself, how well do you know right. yourself? Who are you? And is it exactly where you're, where you want to be and who you want to be in this life and get connected with yourself with, uh, which actually means getting vulnerable with yourself, mm -hmm. which means getting vulnerable with yourself because so many parts of who we are, when we become aware of them, it is scary. It is terrifying. It's not yeah. a part of who we are that we're proud of or that we like, or that we want to show off to the world. Yeah. Saying, oh, that was hidden in the shadows because it's painful to bring to the surface but it is yeah. a part of who I am. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so connection to self, we have to get connected to ourselves and we can only connect with other people to the same depth that you are connected first with yourself. Wow, that's that's heavy. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if someone were to tell me that 10 years ago, I think I would have heard it, but I don't think I would have been able to really grasp it or even know what it means. Yeah, been like oh that's someone who maybe sounds like they know about sure let me agree with you yeah but, but once you really begin to live it and experience it you go oh my gosh yes that is 100 percent right 100 percent so I used to keep people on the surface level because I couldn't connect with them deeply because I wasn't deeply connected to myself right and now that I'm deeply connected to myself I see others who keep me and other people on surface level yeah because they, they just don't know how to go deep and it is terrifying. It is terrifying. They avoid it. They avoid it. They avoid it. They avoid it because they're avoiding it within themselves. Yeah. And then that third piece of connection, and this is the one where depending on your world belief and the world, you know, your beliefs is um, spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is for you in any way, shape of, or form, that spiritual connection. Yes. And so those are the three C's of connection. Connection is the opposite of addiction. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how do we get from, how do we learn to start connecting? So there's three different types. 
So I assume that is there are three different, each one has its own way of resolving the connection with self. You know, they begin to kind of meld together. Okay. They do. Um, but there are also some separations and distinctions. And so um I think like getting connected with yourself, there's it's paying attention and being aware of your patterns. Instead of operating on autopilot, it's being so consciously aware of every single thought, every single choice, every single action and reaction. Mm. Just think of how many times we go throughout our day where we are operating on complete autopilot and autopilot subconscious programming. Yeah. Every single one of us who have ever reached for our phone with mindlessly and all of a sudden you're holding your phone and like, why am I scrolling this? Yeah. Usually that happens. The moment we have a twinge of difficulty or un discomfort show up in our day, mm -hmm. we reach for our phones. Yeah. It's another form of adult security blanket. Or, yeah. or the number of times when we're driving somewhere and say we're going to take a route home that day, but we have to take a detour maybe to the store or something. And it's not our usual route, but then yeah. you miss your turn as if you're just going straight home anyway. Yeah. That's a subconscious autopilot. And so, but that's happening hundreds and thousands of times throughout every day that we're not even aware of. Right. So it's becoming aware of them. So then you can identify the ones that are hurting you versus helping you. So right. that's kind of the connection piece. Um, and then there's also subconscious strategies to help with reconnecting what your subconscious mind disconnected you from a long time ago because it felt mm. unsafe. So things like um, meditation and going into some deep somatic trauma release breath work. Yeah. Which I, I do all of that with my clients as well as um, a breath coach. Mm -hmm. and, ooh, there is some strong stuff that comes up. Those are the big, 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 ugly tears, which are really the most beautiful kind. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so um, there's that saying, you got to feel it to heal it. Mm -hmm. And the more you feel it, the more you heal it. And then the yeah. more reconnected with yourself you are. And so it's feeling all of those challenging emotions to the strongest degree in most cases. Right. Whether it's, uh, you know, sadness or grief or anger for the person who, you know, wronged you. Yeah. You know, and, and allowing ourselves to feel something like there is healthy anger is yes. what allows us to set up boundaries, right? Healthy anger allows for healthy boundaries, right? It doesn't mean that we have to be angry and treat a person poorly, right? But it, means it allows us to take the appropriate action to protect ourselves in the right ways. Yes. It's but true. then if we, if we overprotect ourselves, we might have a 10 foot wall and saying, I'm not letting any love in ever <laughs> <laughs> because when I was open, when my heart was open to that in the past, I was hurt so, so badly. And that's how a person becomes the dismissive avoidant. Right. And so it's reconnecting that, that those, these reconnecting is there's those subconscious strategies. Um, and then there's a thing called pattern interrupts, which I teach my, my clients. It's interrupting the patterns of the past so that in the moment when they show up in your life, whether it's a choice, a behavior, an emotional reaction, um, a thought pattern. Yes. That's not serving you, but it's enslaving you. Yeah. You first become aware of it. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens to show up in your life, you interrupt the pattern of the past with a new pre-decided choice that you chose before that moment of when it came up. But first right. you have to be aware of it and then you decide who you want to be instead. Yeah. And then you interrupt that pattern with the new choice. So it's another, another way to, to reconnect. And it's hard sometimes because when you are so you, when you get awoken by something from the past and it comes into your present, you know, a lot of times people will go back to their old behavior, you know, it'll just, they'll just go back to what they know and you have to really stop yourself. And, and that takes a lot of, of a lot of, of power, you know, like to be able to, and strength, you know, to be able to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this instead because X, Y, and Z, you know, it's, it's, it, it sounds easy, but it's not. Right. Right. And then, you know, there's someone who may 
believe that they've healed and recovered, but it might be a time period in their life when they're, when they don't have major life stresses going on. And since stress is the number one trigger for relapse or mm-hmm. for, um, to be triggered into any disempowering or self-sabotaging behavior or thought, yeah. act, um, you know, someone will say like, Hey, you know, I've been, I've been free from alcohol or free from, you know, whatever it may be for, for six months. Yeah. And then, Boom, there's a death in the family. Boom, they get laid off from their job. Boom, so you know, something in the news and politics stirs something up in them and and then they relapse. Yeah. And so this the best litmus test is when even the strongest life stressors show up in your life. Yeah. And you're able to not fall back into those old destructive patterns, that's when you know you've overcome it. Right. Yeah. You- Oh, but, go ahead. no, go ahead. Finish, finish. Oh, um, one of the strongest testers is going back to visit family because that's where oftentimes a lot of the triggers are because that's the same environment that created the subconscious self-protection patterns that ultimately weren't, they protected you when you, they were in that environment. And then when you shifted away from that environment, the patterns stayed there. And then if you work through them, when you go back to that same old environment, those are usually the strongest of strong triggers because you're around all of the same people and energy and things that showed up that created those patterns. And so there's that saying out there. It's like, you think you've healed and recovered until you, until it's Thanksgiving, (laughs) you go visit your family. And it's so true because a lot of times people, you know, they'll, they'll try to help themselves, but then they, they still, they still put themselves back into that environment, you know, and you really, it's, and it's hard too, because when you do have family, you know, you can't always avoid everybody. And when you do have Thanksgiving, you may see an uncle, an aunt, a mom, a dad, or grandmother that, you know, has hurt you or rejected you or caused you a lot of pain and trauma in your past. And they're going to be there, you know? And so you don't want to, you know, go home and then like, you know, do something that you're going to regret, you know, like, like watch porn or, you know, become, you know, you know, very hypersexual and, and go back to your old ways. And, you know, so it's like, it's being in, you know, if you have to be in an environment, what are some tips that you give people? Like, let's say Thanksgiving or Christmas, or, you know, one of those big holidays, what does someone do when they're at a family event or they're going to be at any event and they know specific people are going to be there that cause them a lot of unhealthy emotions? Yeah. So there's a couple different routes. One of those routes is if you're in a really vulnerable and sensitive place in your recovery, mm-hmm. the choice might be skip that event this year. My recovery is more important than that event. That right. event happens that event always happens every year. Mm -hmm. I want to recover now. Right. And so that's always an option. And then there's the backlash from the family. Why didn't you come? You know, it's, (laughs) and that's another thing that requires that bravery card, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's saying, what do you, what do you value more? And so if you don't feel that you're in a strong enough place yet with your recovery and that, that environment is going to be too triggering. Mm -hmm. You have no obligation to go there. You may feel the obligation. You may feel pressured just because someone else is shaming you or judging you or pressuring you. Yeah. You don't have to accept the shame. Exactly. You You don't have to welcome in the pressure. Right. You don't have to adopt that part of it. And so actually be very, very proud of yourself if you take the action to just be where you need to be for your recovery. Um, and two, there's, if you are going to be in that environment, then it's time to double down on what you've already learned as far as giving your body the neurochemicals that it needs to prevent relapse, Mm -hmm. which I call temporary setback. Yeah. which actually I really then want to turn into calling um, a learning opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep playing with the language of it to make it more empowering. Right. So it's double down, doubling down on the activities that fill your body with oxytocin and um, serotonin. Right. Because when you're flooded with those, you don't have a stress response. So yes. 
um, you know, maybe if you're visiting your family at a holiday or at a wedding or whatever, maybe on your own time, like when you go to bed, listen to a calming meditation, do some breath work, right? Um, avoid the news like the plague. Yeah. And the entire like week or month leading up to the event, <laughs> <laughs> or in fact, just like omit the news completely from your life during your recovery period. Right. Is a very, very good idea. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Or search the news outlets that are going to feel very good to learn about. Right. Very the happy. There's those happy news outlets out there now these days. <laughs> um, and things like that, you know, maybe get yourself out on a morning walk or a midday walk. Right. Either solo or invite your family to go with you. You know, you can even yeah. do the challenge like, like, hey, dad, I'm going to go for um, a half hour walk and I would love to just catch up with you. Right. You going to walk with me? Yeah. You know, maybe if like I have a client when he goes to visit his family, they always have the news is on in the house blaring so loud, like all day long. Oh, gosh. It's so triggering. And there's so many, there was so, a million things triggering in that home. And so using the strategy of like, hey, you want, let's go on an hour long walk. It's like, okay, <laughs> let me get, get away from the news right now. Get yeah. But commotion it's causing in the house right mm -hmm. things like that so there's little little tricks little strategies that one can use you know I think they're really good you know because it could be very challenging you know when especially when you're trying to recover and mm -hmm. I think like when you know when you're telling me all this the first thing I think to myself is that you have to start really showing self love to yourself and yes. self-care and don't feel guilty for putting yourself first and, and showing yourself some self-love because you got to this point where you realize that you are important. You know, I think once someone realizes that you're important, they shouldn't feel the shame or the guilt to put themselves first and to love themselves and, and do things caring for themselves. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and one of the most important things that someone can do with that you don't need any special gadgets. You don't need a special pair of running shoes. You don't need meditation headphones. Yeah. <laughs> it's being aware of your own thoughts. Yeah. Because everything that we say to ourselves or to another person out loud in our head, in a journal, when we say something about ourselves, it is always a form of self-hypnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And we as human beings, we are engaged in self-hypnosis every single day of our lives. Right. We, we're just, we just are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's what, what are you hypnotizing yourself to? What right. thoughts are you feeding yourself? Right. And the stronger the emotion that you have when you feed yourself a thought, the stronger the self-hypnosis is. Yeah. And so it's learning how to no longer self hypnotize yourself into um, thoughts that bring you down, yeah. thoughts self sabotaging, thoughts that bring on self doubt or right. feelings of unworthiness. And if you're having those thoughts, then you're continually hypnotizing yourself in reinforcing those. And when we reinforce those thoughts into our identity, then we subconsciously go and make choices and decisions to then reinforce rejection. Mm -hmm. And that's going to show up in body language, in tone of voice and all sorts of things. Right. We're going to be constantly self-sabotaging on a subconscious level. We may say, I, I really want that job. But if you feel like a reject on the inside, if you feel like, low self-worth, then your subconscious mind is going to have you show up in a way to make sure that you don't get that job during that interview. Right. And it's going to reinforce it. And then you're not going to get the job. And then you're, it'll become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you're going to say, see, yeah, see? <laughs> I knew I was going to get rejected. And I then that, that, yeah, no, keep going. And then that brings on more body language of and, and subconscious choices to then go continue to get rejected or have self-doubt or have social anxiety or whatever it may be. So it's, uh, we need to shift the way that we are inducing ourselves and seducing ourselves with self-hypnosis yeah. through the story we tell, 
ourselves and others through the beliefs about ourselves, right? Feeding ourselves. So it's making that shift. So um, conceptually, it might sound easy to understand, but then applying it, that's where we really go deep in my program on how, what's the how to make it happen. Right. That's really important. Like, what do you do? Like, you know, there are times where I think many people have gone through it is when you're going through stressful times or you're going through trauma, you know, a lot of times if you ever get like those, that negative voice that comes through your head and it feels like there is somebody just trying to, that, that wants to see you fall. And even though it's your own mind and it's your own thoughts, it's like, it's like a gush of, of negativity just blowing through you saying things that you don't want to hear. And it's like, you're fighting with yourself to stop. You know, you just want to be, you just want to be presented around your positive thoughts and those negative thoughts sometimes try to make its way in for whatever reason. How do you stop those thoughts from coming? There's, um, so there's two things that are important there. One is in the moment when you're experiencing it, you can always change your state. And by state, I mean, emotional state. Yeah. And our thoughts are going to match the state of our emotional state. Mm. Our thoughts will match the emotions. Okay. So when there's certain things that we can do to change our state, and we can do that through the music we play, through the our body language, our tone of voice, our posturing, the way that we yeah. physically move, dance around, run around, <laughs> sing, be silly, be goofy. And it's going to feel like resistance at first because right. it's not what you're going to go do with your body and the music you're playing and the the you know facial expressions and tone of voice. It's not yeah. going to match the emotion you're currently feeling. Right. But the subconscious mind has no choice but to obey and it will begin to match mm -hmm. the way that you are expressing yourself physically. Right. Begin Now your internal emotional reactions will match your physical expression. This is why Tony Robbins has his crowd get up and dance and cheer and do all the things because everyone is changing their state. Yes. And then when we change our emotional state, our thoughts match our emotions. So now, ah, when I've put some really fun music on, I danced around, I made a silly face. Yep. Now, ooh, my emotions feel better. Oh, all of a sudden, it mm -hmm. is a million times easier to have a thought that empowers me. Right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, that's great. You know, so that's an in the moment. In, or you can take a cold shower, go on a jog, do sprints. Like those are going to change your state. Those will all change your state. Um, and then when it's, it's important to carve out time when you're not even experiencing that to say, I'm going to do, do a meditation mm -hmm. with my clients. I have them do um, hypnotic meditations where they're actually doing self-hypnosis in the meditative state. So right. it's, it's not like most other types of meditations. It's um, yes. a, a self-hypnotic meditation so I that like they can that. actually make the subconscious shifts where they want to be. So yeah. doing stuff like that, doing breath work, doing activities that activate the vagus nerve and activate the parasympathetic nervous system and elevate mm -hmm. that oxytocin, serotonin. The more that we have those types of activities in our life, then the less frequent we have those self-sabotaging thoughts and the emotions that come with it. Yeah. And when they do show up, it'll be less frequent and with less intensity and it won't last as long. So instead of it feeling like a giant grizzly bear that's attacking you, it'll just feel like a little mosquito that you can flick away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, I had gotten a product one time and it was, uh, it was a, ver a vagus, uh, nerve stimulator and it made you feel so calm. You just put it on the vagus nerve and it was kind of like a vibration, but after the, after it, I think it stood on for about three minutes and then it went off, but you felt so relaxed afterwards. It was like, like a massage on the, on the vagus stir, uh, nerve, but it was, it made you feel calm and it did put you in a different state of mind after it was done. So yes. it is true. You know, it, it, it is very true. You're doing different things and changing your state of emotion can change everything. It'll change your thoughts. It'll change your actions. It'll change your urges, everything. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Absolutely. And that's, that's pretty awesome that you got to use one of those devices and, um, you know, and that can really help and serve as an aid when things are really very difficult. And 
And then also it's another good thing to say, oh, I have made a lot of difficult choices that required bravery where I, I looked inward. I did the the work. I carved out the time. I, yeah. I had the discipline and the bravery to do these things. And now I've graduated away from even needing that. Right. Maybe there was a time in my life, heck, I could have used that all day, every day. <laughs> 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 and then, and it's like, wow. Um, I used to do that with an amino acid called L-theanine, mm -hmm. which is an anxiolytic. It reduces the anxiety. Right. And it's like liquid droppers and it would mm -hmm. work in a number of minutes. Yeah. And I used to have one by my bedside, in my car, in my purse, like every, it was just always on me. Yeah. And use it so many times throughout the day. And it would take me like a week or two or whatever. To, I don't even remember to go through a bottle. Yeah. And I still have it, but it takes me six months, nine months to go through a bottle instead of a week right. because saying, Hey, you know, this is a, a tool that I can use, Yeah, but I've graduated away from needing it as much as I did, but sometimes life is still going to be really challenging. Right. And let me still have that as a tool. Yeah. I need it. And the reason why I don't need it <laughs> 10 times a day anymore is because of going in and making those difficult choices and decisions. Yeah. And the, I'm saying this is, you know, I want everyone else to hear their story and my story inside right. of it. And it's, um, you know, asking ourselves what escapism behaviors or what, what are the crutches that we have that we're using because we feel a sense of insecurity in our nervous system and we need to feel safe. It's our prime directive. Yeah. And it, that's the that's the number one job of our subconscious mind is to keep us safe. Yes. It's and even if we are physically safe in our outer world, we may still feel like we're being chased by the tiger. Right. And so it's how do I get my inner world, my subconscious mind, mm -hmm. nervous system to feel the safety that matches my reality? Yeah. And so that's that's kind of at the core of all of it here. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty powerful. You gave some really great advice today and I love it because you were so detailed and you gave such powerful input, you know, because these are things that um, really people don't realize, you know, and you really, you were really detailed. I, I like all the information you gave. And, and if you really had to give people like maybe three takeaways before we go, what would you really tell somebody who is struggling with either a sexual addiction, a porn addiction, you know, um, how, how, what would be like three takeaways, you know, from everything we discussed? Yeah, I would say the first one is your addiction. It showed up to protect you. It showed up as a, your subconscious mind is attempting to find a solution to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. And so I know that if you are struggling with this, the number one emotion you're probably experiencing is shame. And let's turn that shame into gratitude. Mm -hmm. Gratitude that your subconscious mind always has your back. Yes. And it's always looking to protect you. Sometimes it doesn't know the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it pulls out what it can and what it knows. Right. And exactly. so when you understand that whatever you're addicted to, it showed up as an addiction because when you experienced that thing, your subconscious mind felt more safe than maybe it ever had in your entire life. Right. And so it's not because you're an ugly, horrible person. Mm -hmm. It's because you are a person who needs and deserves safety and love. Right. Because you are a person who needs and deserves safety and love. That's why it showed up. And your subconscious mind is still on the search. And your addictive behavior, or whatever it may be, that is the closest thing that your subconscious mind has found so far. So it's, it's scary for your subconscious mind to let it go. So one... A, we need to turn that shame into gratitude. Two, the moment your subconscious mind has a sense of internal safety, 
is when your subconscious mind says, oh, I no longer need the pornography. I no longer need the booze, the whatever it is. I no longer need the cocaine, the gaming, the gambling, the food addiction. Your yeah. subconscious mind goes, oh, I have it. I have the real version of it. I no longer have to have urges to seek the fake version of it. Right. So there's that. And then three, you may be thinking that others can do it, but not you. And that is a lie. Just because you think it or believe it doesn't mean it's true. Right. We absolutely. 100% have the bravery, the courage, the resources, everything. Yes. You have what it takes to overcome this. Hands down, 100%. I know this to be a truth of the universe. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. So yes. true. So true. Yes. Now, where can people find you on the, on the website? Yeah. yeah. So not on social media mm -hmm. because my front page says, don't follow us on addictive social media. <laughs> <laughs> so I have hours worth of free resource and content on my website. So picture yourself wearing a crown as a king and it's selfcraftedking.com. Selfcraftedking.com is where you can find me and my resources and hours worth of videos and free introduction to my course and, and all sorts of goodies on there. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Jessica, for coming back and doing this podcast with us. And I can't wait um, to hear people's feedback because it was amazing, all the great information you provided today. And I give you kudos for what you're doing, for what you overcame in your own life, how you turned it around and how you actually used what you learned to help others now. So I, I, I give you kudos for, for doing everything you've done. You are a special person. You really are. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. I love my work. I love, I love that I have such a, um, you know, it doesn't even feel like a choice. Yeah. This is what I'm here for. Right. Well, <laughs> and I love it. It's rewarding to help people, you know, yeah. and I think that's what makes people like us, you know, so into it is because we love helping others. And it's just a great achievement when you can help another human, you know, and uh, I think some people are just meant to be on this planet for that, you know, and it's a true calling, you know, yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that and say that I believe that that's true for every human being, whoever existed and will yes. exist, that we as human beings, it is our natural state to want to be of service to others and to give back. But when we have too much pain and suffering, Yes. then we are bound up and locked in our in just survival mode and when we're in yes. survival mode it makes it really hard to give back and be of service and i'll add to that there are there are a lot of people who are in survival mode and they are helping a lot of people and they're stuck in people pleasing they are so fear of rejection that they do people pleasing and they're taking care of everyone else except themselves yes what amazing points. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. I, everybody has it in them, but it's sometimes people get, like you said, stuck into certain things and these behaviors come out. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. When we heal, man, it just, you cannot wait to, to serve the people around you. Like this is the natural human condition for yeah. human condition. <laughs> it is. It so is. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, this has been amazing. I can't wait to you come back. You know, Jessica will be back, you know, shortly. She'll be doing consistent podcasts with us. And so you'll see her soon. And we shall have another amazing topic to tell you about and give you great advice on. So thank you so much, Jessica. This has been an amazing time. Thank you. Thank you.